Hello and welcome to Frame for Light. I'm Dave Kelly. This program is designed to help viewers develop a greater appreciation for both the art and the science of photography. In today's program, we're going to talk about photographing active people. Now, if you think about it, when we do photography, most of the time we're actually photographing people. Now, that could be family, could be friends, or could even be strangers that we meet during our travels. And we want to photograph them in ways that are compelling and interesting so that when we look at those photos later, or if we show them to other people, we can see that those photographs do a great job of telling a story. So we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But first, I want to do a recap of what we talked about in the previous episode, which was episode number four. So in episode number four, we started with a scientific and technical issue known as spherical aberration. Now, spherical aberration occurs when lenses don't converge light to a single focal point. And this is a problem because if you have multiple focal points in your image, it's going to look soft around the edges and slightly out of focus. And so spherical aberration occurs when you have bad lens design or poor lens construction or the way the lens lines up in the lens housing. So if you're noticing that your photos are soft or fuzzy around the edges, it could be that your lens is out of calibration. So you might have to have it adjusted or possibly even buy a new lens if that's what it takes. So then from there, we went on to an artistic point in last week's discussion, which was talking about filling the frame. And when we talk about filling the frame, we're actually thinking about how we can maximize composition in whatever situation occurs when we're out doing our photography, because that's really the point, is we want to maximize any and all situations with composition technique. And one of the ways we do this is by allowing the edges of the frame determine what the composition will actually look like. And I have an example here that we used last week. And this shows that the edges of the frame actually determine what we're really looking at here. The tree on the left leads the eye into the center of the frame. And then on the right-hand side of the frame, we notice that we're, we have boundaries of bushes and trees over there. But by setting those boundaries with the edges of the frame, the center of the frame actually becomes more interesting. Now also when we fill the frame, we want to free ourselves from what we call center orientation. Most people, when they begin photography, they feel like the center of the frame is the most important part of the composition. But actually that's not true. Oftentimes, as we just looked at in terms of using the edges of the frame to determine the composition, the center is not as important as what's on the perimeter of the frame. And we used this example last week where we show this in and we see that the center is not really very important. What's important is the imagery on the right-hand side and also the imagery on the left-hand side. You see that little splash of color in the lower left uh, part of the frame with those red flowers. And you see the building in the background on the left and then the sign on the right. And what's in the center really is not that important. Also, we want to divide our frame into thirds. We have a top third, a middle third, and a bottom third. And when we do that, we have to make sure that there's something of interest in each one of those thirds. And we used the example last week of this image where the top third of the frame is dominated by that waterfall, the middle third is dominated by that colorful koi fish in the water, and the lower third is dominated by that red flower and the greenery around it on the right side and also that rock on the left. So we've covered all the bases here. And also, uh, when we talk about center orientation, another problem that people have is that they put the horizon line right in the center of the photograph. And when you do that, it's kind of limiting because it doesn't really tell us what's important in the frame. Are you emphasizing what's below the horizon or are you emphasizing what's above the horizon? By giving us a 50% um, imagery there, 50% sky, 50% land, uh, we don't really know what story you're trying to tell. Here's an example of how we can um, utilize the top third, middle third, and bottom third to our advantage. So we see that the sky ends before we get to the bottom of that top third. We see the skyline and a little bit of the sky, but the sky is not important. So we want to emphasize in the bottom two thirds of the frame the yachts in that yacht race, and then also on the uh, lower third, we want to emphasize the people who are watching from the rocks. 
Now, when we balance the image in the frame, that means the balance of foreground and background, it's going to make the imagery more compelling. So you have to keep in mind that there has to be interest both in the foreground and the background for viewers to have an interest in looking at the photo. And we used this example from Hearst Castle last week. So that you see that in the foreground, we ha have a lot of flowers and colorful imagery there. We see, of course, the Hearst Castle in the middle. But on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, we have trees so that we're filling in what otherwise might be um, blank space or dead space, as we say. And so you don't want to leave a lot of dead space in the photo because that way the photo is not as interesting. Now, today we're going to talk about photographing active people. And when we talk about photographing people, um, you should realize that humans always dominate viewer interest in any kind of photograph that you might be doing. If you're photographing a, a large mountain, but there are people in the photograph, even if they're small, the eyes will gravitate to the people. And why is that? Because we are organic beings, and humans are people watchers. No matter what the inanimate object is in the frame, even if it's very large, the eyes will always gravitate to people. So we have a built-in advantage in today's topic. Okay, this is an example. You see this steam train. And with the steam train, the uh, train is obviously very prominent and very big and very large in the frame. But once you realize with the corner of your eye that there are people in that shot, your eyes will drift and gravitate toward the people, especially that little boy on the left who's in the red outfit, who's um, got his hands on his knees. Your eye just goes there and it stays there. It doesn't really go back to the train once you realize there are people in the shot. Okay, now when we talk about photographing people, there's this craze about doing selfies. It's been with us for several years now. And unfortunately, that's jaded us in terms of what we see in photography. I know that social media plays a big role in this. People go out, they take photos of themselves, and they post it on social media. But the problem is a lot of these selfies are just uh, bragging rights. It's just like a personal trophy. Look at me. Look where I've been. Look what I'm doing. Aren't I having a wonderful life? And some selfies, of course, can be clever. They can be funny. They can be interesting. And they can be good documentation. But more often than not, it just seems like it's a vanity shot. But I'd like you today to think about photographing people in ways that are not vanity shots. We want to, again, tell stories about people with our photography. And to use an old phrase, a picture tells a thousand words. And so think about photographing people in terms of telling a story about those people in that situation. We have some examples we'll show you in just a moment. Now, those expressions that we see on people should be natural and not artificial. We want to capture honest expression, and we certainly don't want any of those fake smiles. Here's an example. Now, obviously, I had to use a bright flash in this situation, and that's apparent. But otherwise, if you look past the bright flash, you can see there's that girl, little girl and her grandmother enjoying tea. And when you look at the little girl, she has a very natural expression. I would actually even call that sort of a Mona Lisa smile. That smile is kind of, it's not really a smile, but it's, again, it's a Mona Lisa expression. But it looks natural and appropriate for the situation. And if you look over on the right-hand side of the frame, there's a grandmother who's not looking at the camera. She's looking endearingly at her granddaughter. And so that seems very natural as well. So we don't have fake smiles, and we have people who are authentic in this presentation. And here we have another example. You see that this gentleman here is standing with his kabuki cab, and he's offering pedal power, or manpower in this case. And we managed to capture this in a natural and relaxed pose. You can see that he's leaning against the cab with his right arm. He's also uh, crossing his feet at the bottom of the frame. And so this shows that he's comfortable in his environment and in his setting. And so as a result, the smile that's generated from this situation seems to be very authentic. The expression seems very real. And it's because of that relaxed um, body language and body position that we're able to achieve this result. OK, in photography, the eyes have it. In politics, they say the eyes have it. Uh, that's because the eye is the yes vote in politics. So it's a little play on words here. The eyes have it in photography because when we look at 
pictures of people, we look right toward the eyes. We focus on the eyes. And so you, as the photographer, have to then focus on the eyes when you shoot the shot because eyes have to be in crisp focus. Otherwise, the photo is not going to look right and uh, it doesn't matter if anything else is in focus if the eyes are not in focus. So that's really critical. Now, another thing about eyes is where we place the eye line. And the eye line of our subjects should fall about one third of the way down from the top of the frame whenever possible. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule. It doesn't apply every time, and sometimes it's not possible. But whenever you can, you want to make that eye line fall about one third of the way down from the top, kind of where my eye line is right now. And the reason for that is because you want to allow for enough headroom, but you don't want too much headroom and you want that image to be placed in such a way that you have two-thirds of the frame below the eye line as well so that we're we are revealing enough about the person or about the surrounding where that person may be. Now here's an example. You notice that the eye line is roughly about a third of the way down from the top and that's appropriate given the rest of this imagery. Now this image is uh, depicting this woman who's selling a product called Damsel in Defense, which is a nice clever play on words. Uh, the old phrase is damsel in distress, but today's modern woman is in control and she's defending herself in self-defense. And so this woman, the expression on the face is a smile, but it looks like a smile of confidence. It's not contrived. And you can see her posture with her right hand, she's holding that device which is a combination flashlight, uh, billy club. It also has pepper spray or a mace or something like that. And there's even a model that includes some sort of a stun gun. And so she's holding that with confidence. And the other hand or, and the other arm, which is her left arm, is her hand is tucked into her pocket. So she's very confident and self-assured. And so as a result, the smile looks natural and appropriate. And here's another example of a woman who was just finishing a fun run and she's standing in front of that poster after the fun run and the eye line is about a third of the way down from the top. We also notice that she has her hands on her hips. And so when you have the hands on the hips, that could mean several things in terms of body language. It could mean I'm confident, I'm self-assured, I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Or it could also mean that I'm impatient and we need to get on with this. So it just kind of depends on the situation. Now here we see, this is me, this is not a selfie by the way, but this is a picture of me with my hands on my hips standing in front of a cornfield on a hot August day. And so the hands on the hips seem appropriate for this setting. It could be it's kind of warm out here, let's uh, get on with the shot. But uh, I, think, I think it works in this particular situation. And also notice the eye line with the sunglasses still falls about a third of the way down from the top or so. All right, we need, we need to remember some of the tips that we've talked about in the past about foreground and background and also the use of diagonal lines and diagonal relationships. We are talking about photographing people, but we also need to apply those other principles that we've talked about in the past. And here's an example. This is me again, it's not a selfie, but uh, it could be anyone, it just happens to be me. But there we see that there is a human being on the left-hand part of the frame, so we look at that. But we also notice that there's an object in the background that is of interest because it is a diagonal relationship and it's a prominent um, aspect of the photo. So we have that relationship which actually enhances both the person that's in the shot and also the image that's in the background because of that diagonal relationship. Now if we take the human out of that photo, we end up with something like this. And in this case, um, you still get the diagonal lines from the windmill blades and also the diagonal relationship between the windmill and the other buildings, but uh, it seems like it's often more compelling if you have a human in the shot. Okay, when we're talking about photographing people in costume playing a role, which we see quite often on the street or when we're traveling or when we're doing something. We want to capture those folks in costume, but we still need to aim for authenticity. That seems a little counterintuitive because if they're playing a role, that's not authentic. It's because they're being paid to play a role, but that's okay. We, we, we want to take advantage of that and 
aim for authenticity anyway in terms of positioning them or capturing their expressions in a way that seems authentic for that setting. Now here's an example. Here's a fellow who's obviously dressed up as a clown and he's playing um, the accordion and singing on the waterfront there. And so if you notice also the eye line is about a third of the way down from the top, which is appropriate. And we can see that he's not actually looking at the camera, he's looking off camera and his head is tilted to his right. And so that seems authentic. I mean, you wouldn't normally pose that way for a photograph. So he's not playing to the camera per se, and so this looks authentic. Here's another example. Here's the sentry guard at this hotel. He's in uniform and he's got the, the big saber sword there and he's got the appropriate expression of seriousness doing his job. But this has a note of humor because we see that it's modern day life. You see a woman over there on the right hand side doing some painting with a painting ladder and you also see a gentleman behind him in a white shirt going into the hotel. Obviously it's a modern white shirt and so we have this nice little contrast between this historical character playing a role in the front and all this everyday life going on behind him. Okay, now this is an example of a woman who's playing the role of a server in a Eliz Elizabethan themed restaurant. So Elizabethan or Shakespearean time um, restaurant. So we take advantage of what we have to offer in that photo. There isn't much light, so I had to use my flash. The only real light is that little light bulb that's right above um, her head over on the upper left hand side of the frame. And so we illuminate the shot and we can see all of the other accoutrements and all the other uh, furniture and so on in that setting so that it captures the moment and her expression is appropriate for that as well. Okay, now here we have uh, the truth about drugs, a crime fighting group, uh, the superheroes, we, the family including Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, Captain America, and Supergirl. And they're here to tell us not to take drugs and make sure the kids stay away from drugs. So these people are obviously in costume, they're obviously playing a role. And in this case, you can have them pose for the camera. You see the hands on the hips with the two women on either side of the frame and the guys are sort of hamming it up, playing the role of Superman and uh, Captain America, but it's appropriate given the environment and the situation and everybody has a lot of fun with that. Okay, now here we see a man uh, dressed in Scottish attire playing a bagpipe and it looks natural, looks like he's in his element there. And so everything's good with that photo. And then along comes a young family in contemporary modern dress and they're standing there with him posed on the other side and again, it's a nice contrast between the tourists with their modern clothes and he wearing the Scottish attire and the kilt. So as we move along, we know that we have to capture action and follow it until something interesting happens. And what I mean by that is you'll be in settings with people and people are moving targets. So what they're doing right now is going to change 30 seconds from now or a minute from now and certainly five minutes from now. And so if you see something that looks interesting but it's not quite compelling enough, oftentimes it's just a matter of waiting until something interesting does happen and then you have to be ready to capture that. So subjects don't always have to look at the camera as well and that's what's important about action photography is that it's what they're doing, it's the action, it's the activity that matters, not so much having them pose or look at the camera. So oftentimes some of our better shots actually involve people not looking at camera. Here's an example, the water slide. We saw a water slide image in one of our previous programs and in this case we notice that dad is involved in the middle of the frame. So we've got two boys and their dad. None of them are looking at the camera. That's not important. What's important is capturing the essence of that moment and the fun and the excitement and everything that's going on. The, the boy in the front is obviously having a great time. Dad's eyes are closed because the water's splashing in his face. And then there's another boy at the back who seems to be having a great time. So we capture the moment with a fast shutter and no one has to look at the camera and we get the essence of what this is all about. Now in this case, we have people walking through a fruit market and a vegetable market and you'll notice nobody's looking at the camera. And that's, that's appropriate because we're showing a slice of life here, what people do on their daily errands, going through the vegetable market and the shopkeeper on the right who's stocking the shelf. So we don't need to have people looking at camera to tell the story. 
Here we have some folks. Um, I saw this starting to develop, and this is an example of what I mean by follow the action and wait until something significant happens or you get a better shot. Because I was rushed and I was rushing to that scene, um, the camera's a little bit tilted. It's not in perfect alignment. It's not level. And also the fellow on the right, the dad who's holding his daughter on his shoulders, you can't really see him. You can't see his face. So I straightened up the camera and waited for a moment and was able to capture this. So now we have the interaction. We can see the dad's face talking and the little girl who's also talking to the fellow in costume. And so that's what I mean by you got to kind of follow it and wait until the appropriate moment happens and then you capture it. Now this is an example of a similar kind of phenomenon uh, in terms of following people around and just looking for interesting things to occur. This is at the Festival of Masks in Los Angeles. They do this in the fall and it's a celebration of autumn and autumn colors. You can see the golds, the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, all those beautiful fall colors. And you see one of the vendors on the lower right hand part of the frame is actually wearing one of the masks there. And so you have to follow around and just look for interesting things that will happen naturally in festivals like this. So I managed to capture this image of that mask that's a mask of a leaf with a human face. And I thought that was really interesting. Now you can also see faces of other humans, but because that's prominently placed in the frame, and it just looks really interesting. So you want to capture that. That's what I mean by you just walk through the crowd, look for interesting little elements that you see, and then try to capture those elements. And uh, if you're careful about looking around and, and noticing the setting, those kinds of things will occur naturally. OK, now this is an example of the uh, use of foreground and background information. This was at the Maori Craft Center in New Zealand. You see that the object in the foreground is slightly soft, but that's okay because we're focusing on the woman in the center of the frame uh, behind there. And so this is a matter of depth of field. If you have something very close to the camera and something that's farther away from the camera, one of those will be soft, the other will be in sharp focus. In this case, I chose the woman sitting at the table, and I think it works as well as it can. Let's go to the next image. These are folks at the craft table. You see that there's a tourist on the right, and there's the woman who's actually weaving a basket there. They're not looking at the camera, and that's not necessary or even appropriate. We want to capture them enjoying the moment, having a conversation, and working on the basket weaving. And that really tells us a story about what's going on. We also notice that we frame that image so that the people are on the right-hand side of the frame, with the table in the foreground, so we're leading them essentially. And we also see that uh, we utilize some diagonal lines with the uh, arts and crafts. That structure in the background has a nice diagonal line to it. So we're capturing the people and also the environment by framing it in this way. All right, when we position the camera to capture the best results, we want to make sure that we're at the level of the action. So in other words, if you're shooting pictures of children, you want to be down at their eye level. Now, I'm over six feet tall, so if I shoot everything from, six, from a perspective of six feet tall, I'm going to miss a lot of the nuance of what's, ha what's happening uh, in the world of a child. And the same thing occurs when we're shooting our pets, we're photographing our pets. We want to make sure that we're down low and we see the world from their perspective, not from our perspective. And if you do that, you'll be amazed at how interesting the photography can turn out. I have some examples of that here. Now, here we have the little boy uh, getting ready to feed the deer. And you also notice that we talked about the rule of threes, having three objects of interest in the frame. Well, there happened to be three deer. Uh, there. And so they lined up uh, in accordance with that rule. And we see that um, in the position of the camera, I got down actually lower than the eye level of the little boy there because I thought that would give us a more interesting perspective. We're actually at the eye line of the deer. And this is an example of waiting for an opportunity to occur. This is an okay shot, but I figured if I just waited a little bit, something interesting would really occur with interaction between the boy and the deer. And certainly it paid off because there you see him, he's feeding the deer through the fence and there's that activity or that interactivity that 
is the picture that tells a thousand words. So we have him feeding the deer. And in the next shot, you see that the deer also complied with my desire to take a photograph of him as well. Uh, but again, it's at eye level. So when you're at eye level, it's always really helpful to look into the world of the deer. Okay, this is a koala bear, similar to another shot we had on a previous show. But again, we're at the level of the koala. It's a little bit, the koala's a little bit taller than I am in this particular case, but we're close enough to where we can really see what that koala's world looks like. He's looking at the camera in this case. And in the previous episode that we emphasized the koala bear, we used this shot. He's not looking at the camera in this case, but that's also another way of identifying him in his natural type of environment. Okay, now this is another shot where I had to follow the uh, peacock all around that yard, which was a little humiliating actually to have people watching me chasing this bird around in the yard, but uh, with a little patience and staying with it, I was able to uh, achieve the image that I had hoped for. I was waiting for the peacock to, to spread its feathers, and when it did, this certainly did pay off. Okay, now we see uh, birds, the pigeons, in St. Mark's Square in Venice. You know that there are pigeons everywhere in that square, and we have to, again, get down to the level of where the action is occurring. So you have to squat down and take this picture so you're where the action happens. And in this case, notice nobody's looking at the camera, and it doesn't matter. In fact, it's better that they're not. And you can see that they're feeding the birds out of their hands, and uh, it really works well in terms of composition and telling a story of what happens in St. Mark's Square. Now, this is an image of which we used previously where we showed the diagonal relationship between the photographer and the, the little animal that's being photographed there. And so I'm bringing it up again just because, again, we're getting down low so that we're, we're down at the level of where the action is taking place, and that certainly makes a lot of sense. And so we're going to wrap up for today. We'll take one last look at the crime-fighting heroes. Make sure you keep the kids away from those illegal drugs and everyone else. And for today's show, I hope you've learned some new techniques and some new tips about how to photograph active people in active situations. Next time, we'll talk about travel photography specifically and what to think about in advance of doing your travel photography work. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. I'll catch you next time.